So you, when the surprise was the MRI came to India way back in 87, when I started working on this in Delhi and uh, that was the time when we look, used to look at the brain structure and we used to be very excited, oh well this is how you can see brain. You could see sulci, gyri, the grey matter and white matter. And I remember when I was in London in 92, 93 and that's the time the fMRI was getting uh, generated and uh, the people are saying, well, I'm not sure whether it's the real data or the, or, the, or the fictitious data. And I worked with a great guy in one of the labs in Hammersmith and uh, he would say, well, I'm not sure what, what, what signal you're getting. And uh, it was primarily because uh, the you are expecting a change of about on a 1.5 percent those days, field strength, about 1.5 1, percent, 1, 1, 1 to 1.5 percent change. And that you are looking into that uh, particular thing and the noise level was about 2 percent. So, the functional MRI initially the people who are not very you know inclined they say well I am not sure about this. But it has moved a long way uh, and every specialty in neuroscience has accepted it as and more so with the neurocognition, sociology, psychology, psychiatry because they have nothing to look at. That is the only way they, they can look at the brain actually. So, that is how it became very popular with them. And with the clinician, it has still remained a tool to look at the motor strip, the sensory strip and the language. Because a surgeon wants to know that how much far away it is from the tumor and how much you can excise. And that is the magnet which we, have, which we have. And it is a special magnet, it is a very wide bore magnet, 70 centimeter magnet. And it has the themes and the light system, you know, which can vary according to the requirement of the patient. So, the mood elevation, you know, if somebody likes to see a, a dull light or some theme of uh, uh, something, you know, we have available that. And that gives you at least especially the confidence with children, small children. That is why this uh, lighting system was designed and this is the first time in the country we have this kind of lighting system in the, in the machine, which is not available anywhere in the country. Now, question is we are trying to measure the neural activity and the best way which we have been doing for ages is doing neural activity recording in the human brain is by electromagnetic techniques. Electroencephalography and MEG, the currently the MEG which is being used, it has an excellent temporalization. It matches with the brain you know functional connectivity, but it lacks the resolution. That is where people start looking at the other kind of methodology like hemodynamic techniques and PET was being used before the MRI came into picture for the functional MRI or the functional imaging. And the PET was based on the glucose utilization of cells and we will talk about that how the glucose is important and how the oxygen requirement is there and so on and so forth the brain. But the only problem the PET was the PET had a poor temporal, temporal as well as a spatial resolution. But with the coming of the MRI, the functional MRI system available, the functional as, as it became available, you could do it any number of times, no need of any agent, extraneous agent, no radiation, the resolution was good. And that is why people thought that this is the way I think then everybody jumped on it from uh, psychologists, psychiatrists neurocognitive scientists, I mean all everybody in the world was looking at, I think they use more scanners than we use scanners for this and to tell you the truth. Now, why use fMRI? The clinical use basically as I mentioned is the pre-surgical planning for brain pathology. The surgeon wants to know what exactly he should excise. And the basic research is being done by all over the disciplines for on animal as well as humans on the humans you know but all kind of specialist even i was surprised people in arts also they were interested in uh, functional mri <laughs> that's the kind of uh, interest it generated and the very fact there are more than 50 60000 papers actually currently on the and every every year every day you get addition of the papers on this it shows the interest is still there though it's more of getting bo i'm getting bored of this reading this you know because the same kind of lit, lit of is there and same kind of things are there but it gives a tool to a, a scientist to look at the brain the way he wants to look at the brain.
So, while excitement as, as I mentioned compared to PET and the spec which was the one which was being used before the MRI became available, increase the temporal resolution, increase the special no radiation, non invasive, same subject you can do, do a number of times. You can repeat paradigms in the morning, in the evening, in the night depending upon what, what is the paradigm you are looking at. And on a modern scanner, the currently available scanners, the temporality has gone pretty high, the resolution has increased, especially 1.5 to 3 tesla or 7 tesla field strength, the resolution has tremendously gone up in terms of, uh, but still we have not reached the level of neurons to know what is the neural activity, you know. Now, the next issue is what is fMRI? It is a methodology by which we measure the indirect brain functions, indirectly the brain functions. This is not a direct way of seeing the neural activity. It is an indirect way and a lot of debate on this. A lot of physiologists do not believe what we, what we say actually to be, to, be very, to be very frank, because there is a lot of contradiction between what we see on fMRI and what physiology shows you actually on the brain. So, that is where the issue is, I will talk about that. MRI fo, uh, focuses on the anatomy of the brain, it shows beautifully, I mean there is no way to see brain better than MRI. And fMRI focus on the brain activity, what kind of activity? It is pretty well known all over the world that the blood flow and the oxygenation are linked to the neural activity, because any neural activity you need the flow of the blood, you need the oxygenation, you need the glucose utilization and so on and so forth. This is known to everybody. Ogawa was working in NIH at the time, he is a Japanese guy and there was another guy called uh, Robert Knight who was working on the CAT model. So, these are two guys actually came simultaneously with uh, both were in NIH. I was there in London at that time, then that is when people are saying this, you know. I mean I have seen actually the start of the FMRI in those days, you know. And they talked about, uh, I think Dr. Lotter will be discussed a lot about this and I, I said I still do not believe this, you know, what I would always say and so on and so forth. But anyhow, this is how it started and that is when Ogawa came out with an idea that you can actually show the, the function of the brain. And the assumption was that the brain requires oxygenation and which is carried by the vasculature. Any change in the functional requirement changes the blood flow and the blood flow causes the increase in the oxygenation in that area and that is what we are trying to make use of it all the time. Now, this is what is, we know that hemoglobin is uh, paramagnetic. The deoxy hemoglobin is uh, paramagnetic and oxy hemoglobin is diamagnetic. So, that is what we all playing in the fMRI you know basically trying to do the paradigm create the increase in blood flow, the deoxy gets replaced by an oxy more oxygenation which is a requirement for the, the brain and the difference of the oxy and the deoxy we take it as a net function. So, basically it is a vascular change in the vascular oxygenation which we are trying to measure and presume that it is connected to the neurons in that area, because the neurons are requiring the blood, the neurons are requiring oxygen, the neurons are requiring glucose. So, the fMRI, the functional imaging was, was available before the fMRI became available on the PETs and most validation initially was done on the PET scan. Whatever we are doing on the, on the, on the fMRI, we will just cross check with the, with the PET scan, which was the one which was available, you know, and all this. And because it was dependent on the blood oxygen level and this signal was called by Ogawa and his group as the bold signal, blood oxygen level dependent signal, oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, diamagnetic versus paramagnetic. And the interesting there is a terminology in MR, I will talk about that is the susceptibility. More is the paramagnetic or a ferromagnetic material is more is the susceptibility which you see in a magnetic field. And this is what we call as a T2 star effect. The T2 of any tissue is longer than the T2 star. And that is what we have used it in this uh, methodology to quantify the changes in the blood flow. People keep asking why not to quantify the blood flow, you know, simply but there is another technique called ASL which is available today in the world. Or there is another method which I think Dr. Rathor and me have tried uh, in other, uh, other models where we have used uh, the fast component of diffusion imaging, the fast and slow component. 
any change in the functionality will affect the water molecule movement across cell membrane. And that is what we have tried to quantify what is called as a fast component and the Libihan is coming out with an idea why not to use that fast component and see the function that is more close to neuron than the blood. Because you are actually seeing the change in the water molecule movement across the cell membrane. That is more close to the real reality than this reality actually this is what people keep talking about. And there are a number of papers in nature neuroscience somewhere the papers are available where Libihan has shown the only problem right now is the fast component signal change is still not good enough on a 3 Tesla. So, one has to move to higher field strength to see more and more of this kind of thing. Now, this is what I said this, what is the basis biological basis is the neural activity local consumption of an ATP, local energy metabolism, increased CMR glucose metabolic requirement of glucose, oxygenation requirement, blood flow and the blood volume. So, what we are interested in the whole story is the CBF, CBV and CMRO2, oxygen demand, blood flow and the blood volume. This is the whole story of the functional imaging. I mean for me it is a very simple method, it is the simplest methodology available in MRI to be used, but it gives me a lot of fascination to my friends in psychology, sociology and so on and so forth. But methodology is very simple, for us it is no big deal you know doing this kind of technique you know. Now, this is what we call as a hemodynamic response means the hemodynamic response in response to the neural response. So, there is a whenever like even I am talking, so there is a requirement for the neurons the blood flows and that is where the hemodynamic means the blood flow changes and the oxygen changes start coming that is what we are measuring is all about. Now, delay in activation peaking and then the baseline coming to baseline and the total signal change is about 0.2 to 3 percent. I mean you can see what the change we are looking at. On a 3 tesla is 3 percent that is why you see better signal to noise. On a 7 tesla about 5 percent because the T 2 star is linearly related to the field strength. As the field strength goes up that is why 7 tesla is getting going to be a future in MRI on the humans in the next uh, I think 3 to 4 years. And we have kept our demand actually to our uh, owners that we should have a 7 tesla in India you know and especially for brain and the uh, and, and the musculoskeletal system we should have a 7 tesla. Because it gives you more uh, power to look at the data more with a higher resolution. I would like to go to 30 microns, 40 microns, 50 microns on the brain rather than looking at the 1 millimeter data or 0.5 millimeter or 500 microns right. Now, this is the hardware I showed you the example of the magnet this is how the magnet hardware and the software are connected to the machine and that is what and the problem with MRI is that MRI is not something you can just walk in and walk out. It is a high field magnet you need to know what can go inside the machine even for the paradigm generation some of the things which you put inside the magnet have to be magnetic and acceptable. This should be anti magnetic, this should be metallic which is attracting the magnet. So, that is the biggest challenge you know whenever you take anything a lot of people are now working on different kind of things to get the anti magnetic designs or different things. The camera goes in now I think about 87 and we are not allowed to take a camera the shutter start moving you know. Now, there is no shutter camera, but I am telling you in those days the shutters will start flashing you know because the power of the magnet is so much. So, I think the things have to be designed have to be very carefully looked into when you design your paradigms for a functional MRI. And this is the current technology allows you to 3 tesla machine which has the magnetic field strength is equal to 60,000 60, times as strong as the earth's magnetic field. Look at the power of the magnet which you are handling with this. You cannot imagine the way it flies any iron flies, but object flies, it flies like a missile. It we call it a missile effect you know on this on the machine. So, you have to be very careful when you are going with this kind of thing inside. Everything has to be removed, has to be checked in properly, the instrumentation which you want to look at has to be very carefully designed. So, that it is it allows acceptability by, by, the, by the machine itself. Now, what is interesting in this whatever paradigms you want to play you need to have a camera inside, you need to have uh, the screen to project the camera 
and all the paradigms need to be looked in by the patient or a person or the individual lying inside the machine. It, be, it has to be mirrored into the eyes. So, that all was developed right in front of us when we started looking at this and it is available at Sanjay. Actually, the new machine which we had bought, I bought everything in that machine actually. We had a complete set of fMRI machine actually at SGBJ, we bought everything in that machine. So, this is what the design of the, of the system is, especially for uh, like button response, you want to push a response, yes, no, whatever you want to do, all things are designed into this. So, any paradigm which has to be decided by you, it has to be acceptable to the machine. Within the confine of the machine, we have to design those uh, parameters. Now, the other fMRI or MRI equipment, whatever fMRI, one other thing you want to make is a myth by people. So, a lot of people say that fMRI and the MRI are not the same, they are the same, they are done on the same machine. A lot of people say that the gradients and other things, they are the same. You need a magnet with high field, you need a gradients, you need the RF, you need uh, shim, you need everything like you know, like or the shim cabinet and all this thing you need like any, any other machine. So, if you I, I sometimes hear some scientists saying no, well, I, we have fMRI machine. So, any machine which is having a good field strength can do an fMRI provided you have the desired attached hardware you can use in you know extra to put in there. So, every machine is capable of doing RF coils are required, the T 1 to relaxation times. What is important is the T 2 which is the decay of the MR signal after the RF pulse is delivered and it measures as a T 2 relaxation or transfer relaxation time and the T 2 star which is gets quickly defaced because of the inhomogeneity in the magnetic field and that is what we are using in the fMRI, the T 2 star effect which we use every day on the clinical practice I use T 2 star effect every day you know and in some form or the other. Now, what are the techniques which we are using? The most use initial technique before the API begins. The, the interesting thing which is uh, about uh, the functional MRI is before the API, the eco planet imaging became available, people were using the flaw, the fast low angle shot or a gradient echo imaging to look at the function. But the gradient echo imaging was very slow as compared to the API. And API became available simultaneously in 93. So, the concept of API came I think even before the MRI was designed. I think the, he, he, the Peter Mansfield gave a, gave a concept in 74, 75, the theoretical concept of uh, API you know for which he got known rise actually. And actually implementation of the API was possible in 93, 92, 93. So, you can see that what how much difference in actually is, is the believing and seeing is being done. So, that is that's the kind of thing is there. And once the EPI became available, the EPI is even today, all techniques we are using is an EPI based techniques. Now, we wanted to make it first much faster, the EPI to be much faster and that is why a lot of ultra fast techniques came available like the half furious, sense, smash kind of techniques where you could actually take the central case space which reduce the timing of the, of the, of the phase encoding steps and you could get it much faster than uh, what we are doing. So, today you can actually get uh, typically a single scan in about 100 milliseconds you know which is uh, pretty fast actually is what it is. So, now the issue is why T 2 star, I mean I told you why T 2 star because uh, we are using the oxy and the deoxy difference and T 1 does not show the difference. It is basically the T 2 star that gives the difference that is why we have to use a T 2 star imaging for an EPI is not the best T 2 star imaging, but EPI is being used because that is the fastest. It has a very high temporal resolution that is why we use it because moment there is a you think there is a change in the neural function that I cannot catch by the machine. Whatever best you can catch you should catch that. That is why a lot of people say it is a stabilized uh, function you are seeing not the actual function you are seeing in the brain. I mean it is a lot of things which are there in this. You know. So, this is what is the mixture of the bold effect we call it altered neural activity change in the local hemodynamics and the fMRI. This is what actually we are talking about the bold, bold function. 
and there is a conflict need of glucose need of oxygen combining both and what is causing the the, the whole thing you know it is confusing but for us for this talk or for any other talk in fmri we know that indirectly we are measuring the neural signal that's all basically we are trying to see the hemodynamic response function which is a neural function there is no linearity between the response hemodynamic response and the neural function that we all know and that is what what best we can do actually and this is correct because it is important because some of the fmri and the neurophysiological experiments have yielded conflicting results you will surprise even the motor strip in the brain what you see when you go inside the machine uh, and uh, open the brain and stimulate the motor strip sometime it is not the same as what you see on the functional mri <laughs> and to that extent so there if people are done the uh, fmri inside the machine inside the operation theater then they stimulate that area and again they look at the area there is a conflict conflict in this so it's a gross make believe kind of thing in terms of functionality but that's why i was saying that the blob comes in this way or that way most of the time these are the regions that are involved and uh, difficult to say what we are looking at so this is in order to estimate the validity of the linear transfer model it is necessary to see how fmri signal correlates with measure of neural activity but doing this is not straight forward we all know that the relationship of fmri and the neural activity depends on a couple number of factors so one is that uh, large region of the cortex over the long period of time that's what we are doing simultaneously activity of the many neurons we are trying to catch up with this so that is what actually we are doing averaging firing rate of all the neural population and whether the activity is synaptic or dendritic we are not sure about the, what we are what we are saying I mean, as i mentioned repeatedly so one of the guys who published in 2001 nature he said that it basically reflects the intracortical processing of an area rather than a spiking of the area by combining all the methods you know he, he concluded that bold fmri is just an average function which you are trying to measure in that area rather than, i want to make it very clear before we go into real thing and we we believe that what we are saying is correct you know i'm not sure what that <laughs> even today now what are the designs is used first of all whatever you are interested in you make an hypothesis create a paradigm the biggest challenge in fmri is not the fmri doing it or analyzing it is the generation of paradigms what is your question and how you want to answer it how many subjects you want to take how you want to stimulate and what are the kind of design and paradigm you are looking at is a block design even related or mixed of mixture of all this thing and the parameters more or less fixed in mri i don't think we need to do great science to know the fmri parameters for running a scanner what we need to know is the hypothesis how to generate the paradigms and uh, how to get the answers you are interested in that's the most important part of this so this is a classic example of block design where you put uh, on and off on and off then you can do uh space mix trials or rapid mix trials whatever you want to do whichever one like you keep doing keep in a short interval or a long interval whichever way you want to design your methodology you can do that and everything has to come into the machine and patient has to look at that and whatever method you want to design he has to practice his outside practice in a simulator before he is allowed to take inside a lot of people say even to the extent that once you do this kind of practice the patient gets used to it habitual effect i mean we don't know there's so many things happening you know so a lot of papers come on habitual effect this effect that effect which comes on that trained you get trained you know you're training the neurons before that actually so is there not a habituation effect but may compromise signal strength the problem is if you do a short thing short kind of a paradigm then snr becomes very poor signal is very poor that's why people do it for 30 seconds do it repeatedly that particular paradigm so that you get a good signal noise otherwise a short spike paradigm is not going to give you a good signal so, and so many times you put your statistical analysis you may actually become a noise rather than a signal so that's the case space i think the doctor knows more about the case space than anybody else to transform the case space into image on uh, mri and that's the software which is available currently is being used 
the Unix based softwares are available, FLE, SPM, which is available for Welcome Department of Imaging Neuroscience. FSL is again a very technique which I've used a little bit, not in FMR and other, other, other methods. I'll talk about that tomorrow morning. And uh, there are vendor based techniques like G has a brainwave that's available at HPGI. Philips has a brain voyager which is bought by the Philips actually. I view the, we have I view, but brain voyager again a part of Philips. And advanced neuro Siemens has that kind of system. So, everybody has their own system which is available and you can use any of the system you like which you feel comfortable with. The most commonly used techniques are the FSL free uh, downloadable net from the net SPM and FLE. FLE is so NIS it is free you know it is anything which is the government of US does it is free to everybody. So, these are the software which are Unix based, but they are freely available on the net. SPM also has a non Unix like even in the windows you can run the windows, but FSL definitely it is Unix. Now, analysis is a special processing estimating parameter of statistical model and making inference about those parameters estimated with appropriate statistics. So, basically how you play with your statistics your data and how you a lot of uh, analysis has to be done. This is how the analysis is done. Realigning if you are doing a group analysis you have to realign register the data together. Smoothing kernel is being used normalization template and lot of people are using the, the there is something typically the template come from Montreal MNI template you call it. So, the Montreal Neurological Institute developed a temp, brain template which everybody wants to put their uh, everybody's brain into the template and try to register with the template actually. But you can make your own template, create your own data set and create an own template and you can use, use it as a, but the most commonly designed template is a uh, uh, MNI template which is being, everybody is using that and we all use that. May not be an MNI is not only an fMRI it can be used in any way, any type of brain function you want to study not only with fMRI you know. And then statistical uh, analysis you, you do and how much it should be your cut off is 0 0.01, 0 0.001. So, you can decide and you can actually check whether the function is actually coming from that by the functional paradigm which is attached to that you know. So, this is the variance removal, realignment, co-registration, normalization, smoothies I talked about, improves SNR. And this is the different method models are used for uh, statistical model analysis. And this is what actually typically comes as an observed function as, as you do the functional analysis you find that the on and off can be picked up by the computer. And when that point is picking up you can put your cursor and see whether the function was there you can put the area which is there estimated look at this and see whether the function was there or not. So, many times a lot of artifact has to come in there you know and that becomes a function. So, a lot of rigorous analysis because now it is now more than 20 years old technology. So, people have done a lot of rigorous analysis and, and, and removed a lot of things which were there earlier and a lot of people reported artifacts uh, as a function in earlier days you know. That is why in the first 5 years everybody used to call it a fictitious imaging not a functional imaging actually. <laughs> so, that is the combination I just talked about both we have. So, that is a regression, two sample, t pair test, whatever you want to use for activation maps. And what we use is use a standard T1 maps, high resolution imaging of the brain, and overlay the functional maps on top of this. Otherwise, the maps that you get on a, on a EPI images are pretty bad. So, you just collect your function and overlay on top of the, the standard high resolution imaging. So, you can define the NRP in 2D and 3D, whatever you want to do the reconstruct your brain and do that. Now, positives and negatives of MRI you know that is very important for us to know what are positive potential for high temporal and special resolution, lacks radioactivity can be repeatedly number of times performed in increasingly common state of the art MRI machines you do not have to that is what you do not have to design a special machine to do fMRI. It is the same machine you can use for a patient use for you, you can use for social sciences you can use for anything you want you know. And it has definitely much better temporal resolution than the PET even today with the time of flight and whatever the PET is available today even that is people are not using PET at all today in fMRI. 20 years back yes not today. Negatives are extremely sensitive to head motion awkward environment for emotional paradigms 
in, inside the machine to create an uh, emotional environment uh, paradigm is very difficult. Contraindications are there, extremely claustrophobic, irreversible magnet device, loud sounds from the magnet, cannot perform receptor ligand study like PET and SPECT. And there is a time lag of 3 to, three, three to 6 seconds before between the brain region is activated and the blood flow increases. So, so, there is always a lag. So, you are not actually measuring the, the neural activity, you are measuring the flow changes. And you can use simply a, a, a dynamic contrast or whatever, you can use any flow method and you can quantify that. Why only fMRI? You know, these are the questions people keep asking, you know. Now, this is typically I use a lot. Uh, motor function, assessment of the motor task. And this is primarily I do almost once a day, one patient a day I get a brain tumor and the surgeon wants to know where is the motor strip. And this can be designed in different ways. You can do a tongue movement test, you can do uh, the passive movement of the limb, you can do the hand movement, finger uh, spreading, finger tapping, finger tapping on thigh, whatever you use, basically it has to be motor activity. And you can combine all also to see the whole of the motor strip and uh, on and off like 10 second 10 scans of 30 seconds on and off you can do you know for 6 minimum 6 times and then you take an average of the on and off to get some signal whatever you are getting with this. So, this is a classic example of the motor function which we have and this is what we do in the brain tumors. Now, this is an example if you look at the motor strip here for example you know and the motor strip there. So, the, the mass is pushing the motor strip anteriorly the function is anterior. The surgeon left about one and a half centimeter. He did not go beyond the tumor. So, this we do along with the tectography day in and day out. That is our routine clinical stuff which we use every day, you know, in the clinical practice. Okay, this is how it is. And this is how the function is coming, you know, like a curve, you can see the curve and the peak is the function and then then down. And you can just take any of the brightest object, put your ROI and you will get the function is right or not. So, it is pretty automated I mean in that respect, nothing no great deal at all. You know as far as doing fMRI is the simplest thing to do on MRI. <laughs> the paradigm and the processing these are the ones which are important which you guys have to do. Now, I just took some of the examples from the literature that uh, pain understanding pain you know that is another interesting area where you need to know about the pain. And uh, once you uh, prick a pin in the hand, so I always believe that whatever I do here, whatever I do, the guy on top controls it. The brain is the father of everybody. <laughs> People who say there is a spinal reflex, nothing. Even a spinal reflex has to go through the brain. And look at the speed with which it, it, it functions, you know. If you see a lion, you do not even wait for a second to, to look at the lion and say, you immediately tree back. So, look at the functional connectivity so fast. And people say, you used to call it, I remember earlier days, the spinal reflex. No, the reflex is coming from the top. So, that is what the pin break or a whatever type of, uh, you know, stimulus you give to the, uh, it goes to the brain and brain takes a call or has to be done about this. You know. So, I have realized over 20 years in neuroscience that brain is a master whatever you do, you know. It controls everything and anything, you know, not in the spine. So, pain is not mechanical. Is it mechanical or is it uh, emotional or it is uh, something to do with the sensory effect on the body? why some people uh, take much more pain than the others, is there an emotional component in pain. These guys have tried to do this, a uh, number of papers have come on that. So, this is how people have designed the paradigm. You can see a lot of instrumentation is there and where they have tried to painful heat uh, and try to look at the function. And another interesting which I liked about number of people have come in that you put a pressure in the in the rectum the visceral pain. Visceral pain is much more different than the somatic pain. It is more discomforting than the somatic pain. So, this lady designed uh, the methodology for the visceral pain and uh, published number of papers on that. 
putting something inside the rectum balloon it, put a pressure on the rectum, get a feeling of discomfort and see what is happening in the brain. This is related to the autonomic system you know which is getting involved in this. So, look at the stimulus, look at the, the heat temperature 40 degree and beyond 40 degree. Noxious heat versus the normal heat, I mean 40 degree is still not that bad. And stimulation prefrontal, I mean this I see everywhere, prefrontal insulin, anterior cingulate, prefrontal cortex and the other one which are thalamus, the other one which are actively get involved in this. And uh, thalamus of course, controls this. And that is what they have shown is the main effect of laser induced uh, pain on the brain regions. And this is the intensity, if it is unpleasant or pleasant, the intensity can be correlated with the, the type of pain you are giving you know. It means the emotion comes into picture, when the unpleasantness is there, the, that is what they have tried to differentiate uh, emotion from the, the pain. Some people even smallest pain, they are more emotional and the pain get exaggerated and some people we, they have no emotion. So, that is another issue you know that if you have the, the random population, where you have the guy who is from the village and I remember when I was a student of medicine. So, a person will come, a village will come, you put a stitch on his finger, he said no, do it, no anesthesia required. On the other hand from a city, he is very sensitive, he will not let you touch, he will not let you clean this. So, that is the, I mean, I mean it is all in the brain what kind of development you have. So, even in that you have to your selection of patient, the selection of your subject has to be very, very you know same kind of I mean difficult design to make. So, it looks nice in a picture, but to design that kind of thing it is not easy and you get some blob somewhere I can tell you that you know that is not a problem. So, this is the difference between the, the, the visceral pain and the somatic pain, the different areas for the different pain and the, the lower G i versus upper G i stretching in the and the somatic and the tonic and the phasic uh, kind of pain which you can see the difference. So, it is nice to see that you can see different areas, but where, do, where does it lead us to? I mean we do not still know, we know something, but we do not know anything, I am not sure about that. Pain clearly activates a large amount of neural uh, tissue consistent with the original broad hypothesis that the pain is coming from the brain, but how to interpret in terms of you know uh, real life situation you know if the guy is having a pain, had a trauma this that, how, how to relate in terms of functionality, improving the functionality, improving the, the, the pain of that individual that is another issue you know. And the chronic pain is all the more problematic. It, it helps you to understand pain to some extent, but where do we stand after at, at the end of the day? That is another question. So, the very good question which you can understand, but what it leads to further we do not know. I mean, these are issues which are still you know being talked about. So, this is a, a review, a line from the review which says, how neuroimaging studies have challenged us to rethink about the chronic pain and disease. Imaging studies have shown that chronic pain is associated with functional, structural and chemical change in the brain, thus putting it into the realm of disease state. So, chronic pain people say it is like a functional, it is not doing thing properly, that is why it is doing it. So, something has happened, it makes you understand something is going wrong somewhere. What does it mean we do not know? So, that, that is another thing which I will talk about. Very good tool to understand. But uh, this is another example of block design where they have done actual stimuli, no stimuli of the pain and seeing the difference you know. And the rating, they did the rating of the pain, the physical rating of pain of the physically induced pain, but versus the one which were you are told we are giving you pain, but not actually doing the pain. And there was a difference in the uh, if you just tell the guy, he's, you know I as a doctor can say, tell you that, when you go and inject something to the patient, even while you are not even touching the patient, patients start crying. This is called as hypnotically induced pain or, or perceived pain, before you go in. When you actually put in love for the pain, <laughs> pain comes, it comes in there. And so many times the patient feels pain even after you take out everything and he says, no, I am still having problem. 
uh, some guys say no, I do not have a problem. So, these are the interesting issues which you know, which I mean I like these sort of things, I thought they should talk about those things. So, that is what he says the actual pain and uh, hallucinated pain. It means there is some activity in the brain even when he is perceiving pain without giving a pain, but it gets intensified the more it gets activated. Look at the phonics, the way the phonics is coming up in time. So, they become all the more activated, you know, that is what he is trying to say. Pain versus emotion, you know, how much is emotional component, how much is the pain component, and I am not sure how to how to separate that. I mean, they have tried to do that, you know, different paradise. <laughs> So, when you give, I, I remember when I was started doing uh, psychology work with MRI, I basically started with the uh, hepatic encephalopathy. That is the one which actually made me think that that uh, psychology or a neuro, neurocognition is important for MRI, you know. And I was doing one uh, paradigm, you know, uh, neuropsychological paradigms, and my timing was much, much worse than the normal individuals. So, then I asked them that is it I have a hepatic encephalopathy or my brain is not functioning properly or is it the way I am, I am designed to work like this you know. So, some people are very slow learner, they take more time to learn, but once they learn they do well. Some people learn very quickly, but they forget very quickly you know. I mean everybody is like memory comes into play, the, the short term memory, the long term memory they all come into play. So, I think this is another issue which is uh, interesting, important and uh, they say that uh, emotion versus the non emotion, the difference in the. Now, couple of things I will just talk about now is uh, which I thought is very current you know, magnitude and the cortical activation on imaging. So, when you tell something, some things are pleasant, some things are unpleasant. How the pleasantness affects the functionality and the unpleasantness affects the functionality. It is very interesting in 2012 it came. So, what they are trying to show is that the unpleasantness gives you more stimulus to the brain and the different areas are activated as compared to the one which are you know pleasant things you know. And by subtracting they can tell that this is unpleasant part, this is a pleasant part and so on and so forth. They have designed paradigms for that. So, the magnitude of intensity, what the guy, what they have done is interesting paradigm, they keep the guy hungry. Then they do the imaging and functional imaging, and then as they are at rest, and then they give a taste of sucrose, which is a pleasant thing, you know, like sugar. So, if they give some bitter, it is an unpleasant thing. So, that, that is how they are trying to find out that how the functional activity changes in the fasting, in the fasting stomach, because the fasting you are actually hungry, it comes from the brain, the satiety centers get, get stimulated, it comes, it comes from the brain. So, I mean it is all kind of things people have tried. I mean if you look at the this literature, it is full of everything you know. Now, this is another example of uh, grammatical categories of object noun, event noun, verb in order to the cortical region activation. So, noun and verb how they affect the you know brain activity you know. So, this is an example of the noun words, pseudo words and true words and there is a difference in the activity of the brain. Now, this is by masking the uh, uh, pseudo and then you see the true activity coming in from there you know. Now, this is another interesting but I told me like it, the difficult question versus the simple question in mathematics you know. <laughs> and they, they have found somebody who, who knows the problem, how the brain function differs than the guy who is find gets stuck to the problem you know. This again a very new article actually. <laughs> so, this is like they give you some kind of a paradigm you know to like 2 and 4 and 3 is equal to 9. So, they create some 4 and dollar 3, they want to push a button and then they change the paradigm and that is the that is how they want to look at this paradigm. And what they find is the different areas talk about the difficulty in mathematics versus the you know like metacognitive, anticognitive, mixed and the cognition you know and its relationship to the to the brain. There is another example is the holding disorder, there is another called the, like the guy who hold you know and OCD is again a kind of compulsive disorder. Now, how to differentiate a holding disorder from OCD? So, they have designed a very interesting paradigm I was saying 
if the guy has something which is of his own, then what is given to him? So, what they found is, if the guy who is has his own thing and you give him back, he like to hold it, you know, keep it. And the person who, whom you give things which does not belong to him, he is not very, you know, interested in that, as opposed to the OCD. And this is a paradigm, which is a very interesting paradigm they design and, uh, and they have shown that they can create a difference in the activity of the holders versus the OCD versus controls. So, this is how the different activation maps they are showing. And another, another interesting thing which they are talking about is the hearing criticism. Like some people react differently to criticism <laughs> from their own parents, you know, as compared to the others, you know. So, I think different design phase, this again 2012, plus one it published and how the depression and what are the relation to depression and, and, the, and the different activities, you know. Criticism and rest, then the different uh, like the hipp hippocampal, the cingulum, the frontal cortex, how they are affecting the criticism versus the reaction of criticism to the praise, how they are perceived by the individuals. And this is an example of uh, criticism versus and the diagnosis of criticism versus the non criticism. The lastly, I will talk about uh, MCI and uh, how the functional neural correlates of attention deficits affect the MCI, you know, which is the one which you talk about in Alzheimer's, early Alzheimer's disease, you know, which you as a psychologist you are more interested in this. That is a paradigm they have designed and what they have shown is the difference between the MCI with the controls, which are the areas which are affected with these paradigms in MCI respect to healthy controls, alerting and orientation effect. And the same way they talk about the different maps, this is actually is a smoothing, it's nothing is an MCI versus the RC is more than MCI. This what you are seeing in the brain shape is very simple to make. If you go to the FNE or you go to this FSL, these are pretty standard software methodology available on this. So, nothing great about looking at these images in, the, in terms of that. So, I think with this, I just give you the brief idea of that what all the uh, potential it has, what all lacunas it has, what, it, or what all it can do and how far we can understand this. I am not still sure we can understand everything about the brain function. But certainly, it is a direction in which you go and uh, little more positivity is there, more objectivity is there than what a psychologist will tell you otherwise, uh, well you have some uh, paradigm which are affected that is why you are and it may depend on his mood. If I give you another example, if a mood is not good, I may not do any, any paradigm correct and that may give an impression that I am having some psychological decline or, or cognitive decline. But if you have some objectivity assessed to it, then it makes it more meaningful in terms of understanding the you know your domains whatever you are doing. So, I think it is a simple technique it can be done very easily on any, any instrumentation, but you have to have the right kind of design of uh, the paradigms to assess your question. This is most important part of this.